Hi everyone, how are you? Monica here. We are here for the training, how to leverage your inner activist when CPS comes knocking. Let me just adjust my settings here. Okay, I'm still wearing my workout clothes. I was gonna put on something fancy, but I, I'm too comfortable in this. So we're just gonna get started. If you are joining me late, no worries. This is going to be uh, saved inside the group. And I do have people requesting to join the group right now. So I might be pausing momentarily to let them in. Well, we're just gonna get right into it, right? So let me tell you right now my background on all this stuff. Like, am I qualified to even be talking with you about this? So the answer is yes, because I personally have extensive experience with DCF, extensive. So in Connecticut, CPS is called DCF, okay? Now I have lots of personal experience with DCF and most people don't know that you know? And, and it's fine because and the reason I don't really share that a lot is because I don't I typically do not work with parents who have DCF involvement why is that if I have personal experience in DCF and I do what I do with divorced parents or divorcing parents why don't I work with parents who have CPS in their lives the majority of parents who approach me with CPS issues need trauma care like some sort of some sort of coach that is trauma informed because when kids are taken from you and thrown into foster care there's something internal that gets completely disrupted inside at a cellular level it's if you're a man it's like being castrated you have a person twice your age who probably doesn't even have any kids stealing your children and throwing them into foster care and that is very castrating for a man and for a mom who gave birth to these children typically it's 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 horrifying so when a parent approaches me saying my kids are in foster care what do i do i need your help i know how to help them on a on a tactile level but i don't i am not trauma informed so it's a major liability issue for me because health coaches can only work with people that have a baseline level of health. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean I can't work with you if you have diabetes, if you have depression? No. If you are so shaken up and destabilized from your kids being put into foster care that you can't even work and can't even do things like go to the store or drive a car or talk to your mother on the phone, if you can't perform basic functions, then I'm not the right coach for you. I'm not trauma informed. It's a liability issue. I would love to help these parents. For three years, I turned away 80% of the parents who contacted me because they were so traumatized over having their kids taken. And this, the CPS parents were the ones that were the, the most traumatized. And so one of the reasons why I started building courses was so that the liability piece wasn't as much of an issue. So parents who are dealing with CPS can take my course and have more uh, and, and get the information that they need. And there's a little bit of a buffer between me and the, the parent where I'm protected and they are also protected because coaching can be very messy work. It can be very confrontational. And if you're not functioning at a baseline level of health, it can absolutely uh, make your condition worse. So I always recommend that if you're suffering gravely, do get the help that you need while you're working with me, period. I can't stress that enough. So that's why I don't work with parents typically who um, are going through CPS hell. Now, that being said, Occasionally, I will take on a parent that is going through this, and I work with them privately. Okay, I was an ADA advocate in the family courts for, or the family courts and the CPS courts for five years, and I have seen these cases up close and personal. I, in fact, I have more experience sitting through CPS court cases than I do uh, family court cases, because the majority of the parents who need me in the courtroom are going through CPS. Uh, abuse and trauma. So I'll just say one more boring thing before we move on to the real training. Um, what was it? Oh, <laughs> so this is the most ironic thing in the world. My success rate with parents who have CPS involvement is much higher than my success rate with parents going the, in the family court system. So what I'm saying is the, the, the parents who are able to work with me, who are healthy enough to work with me, they get the absolute best results out of anybody I've ever worked with. They have more at stake, they have more on the line, and they are willing to go in with both feet 
and use their rights and they're not as afraid as parents in family court. They're, what I'm saying is they are afraid, but they have more to lose. So they're willing to put it all in. Whereas family court, you know, the parents are a little bit more on the edge. They're a little bit more on the edge of the diving board. They don't want to dive in. They, they want to be more cautious. They want to weigh out all their options because typically the child is in the other home, the, 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 their ex's home, and they know that their child isn't suffering as much as your kid would be if you're in foster care. So I hope that clarifies some of, the, some of those issues. And we're gonna just get into the actual training. So let me just see if anyone wants to come into the group because I know people were trying to get in. And if you have comments about this uh, training, if you have questions, I will get to your questions at the end of the training, okay? So go ahead and make your comments, ask your questions, and I will absolutely get to you at the end of the training. So let me just let these parents in, and you do have to answer the questions if you, um, if you want to get in, you have to answer the questions. So some parents unfortunately have not answered the questions, so I'm not able to let them in, um, but hopefully they will get in at some point and, and watch this replay. So let's get right into the training. So, <laughs> So yes, yeah, so uh, let me just throw in another boring disclaimer. Uh, this is not legal advice. My legal advice to you is to get an attorney. <laughs> and if you are going to get an attorney, I would absolutely get an attorney that's going to defend your rights. If you're working with a court-appointed attorney, I'm going to teach you how to use that court-appointed attorney to your advantage. Court-appointed court attorneys have no incentive to really defend you. They get paid bottom-of-the-barrel wages, typically, they work with um, extremely difficult clients. They, are, they have no incentive to invest in the welfare of their clients. If, you, if they're court appointed, getting paid 50 bucks an hour, which is like 20% of what their peers that they graduated law school from with, wrong preposition, they graduated, did I say high school? Uh, law school. <laughs> so... I say the wrong word all the time. If you guys have been following me, you'll know that. So if, if they've graduated law school with their their peers who are making five times what they're making, they're not going to invest in your welfare. So the way to handle a court-appointed attorney, I will get into later on. And so this is not legal advice, but I am sharing this with you because it is in our interest as citizens to speak about issues that are a matter of public policy. And this is a matter of public policy and this Im impacts us, it impacts our next generation. These kids are gonna be going into the military at some point, they're gonna be doctors, they're gonna be teachers. Do we want damaged kids joining the military and getting, you know, learning how to use guns? Do we want damaged kids growing up and teaching in our public schools? Do we want damaged kids becoming surgeons? So we have an interest in making sure that the, this generation is protected. And it's, it's up to us to do that. The government will not ever, ever protect our kids unless we are holding them accountable and asking them to protect our kids. And the way we do that is by m reminding the government that we have rights and that they can't be trampled on without an, a, a very abundant amount of due process. So we might not get into that today, but if you watch my podcast and my other live streams, I talk about that quite a bit. So... It's, it's in our interest to have these conversations and that's why I'm here. It's not legal advice, but it's gonna sound like I'm giving legal advice because I'm sharing with you what I've done in the past, what my clients have done and what I would do in the future if CPS ever came back into my life. And they know not to come into my life now, but they have definitely, definitely harassed me uh, quite a bit. My husband, they've harassed us both extensively. So um, our background with CPS is that we, um, my husband and I met reforming the Connecticut laws and within a month yeah like a month of us reforming the Connecticut laws uh, DCF was knocking on my husband's door threatening to throw his kids into foster care I mean that's the long story short and so um, they have knocked on my door when I had a six-week-old baby in my arms I have hid in the closet from CPS um, banging on our door with police officers and the whole nine everything you could think of we've experienced and we have pushed back, we never flinched. We have always said, no, you can't violate our rights, go away, you know, and, and, and very kindly, we, well, I'm very kind, my husband's not, but um, I have very kindly said, you know, thank you for your concern, thank you for being concerned about our parenting, but we don't need your services, thank you very much. And we have always declined from the get-go. We have never signed a case plan. We have never, ever agreed to counseling or parenting classes or 
drug testing. We've never agreed to any of that. We have always asked for warrants. We have always asked for trials. And so to this day, like we're, we haven't been messed with um, as a result, not, not in the long run. Anyway, so let's get into this. I'm sure you're super excited to be here. <laughs> so we covered, um, I'm not trauma informed, we covered that. So um, I'm gonna tell you that there are pros and cons, <laughs> believe it or not, with working with CPS as opposed to working with family court, okay? I know that's hard to believe because CPS sucks. So um, let me just check one more time to see if anyone's trying to come into the group. Because, you know, human beings, we like to wait until the last minute to do everything. So let's see. Okay, good. Um, okay, so here's some interesting advantages of working with CPS as opposed to working with family court. Um, CPS has laws. They have standards. They have regulations. They have a, a textbook protocol that they have to abide by. And that is actually to your advantage. It is a good thing to have a set of rules and restrictions and regulations. And, um, and it's good because when you have a framework and you have something concrete that you could refer to and read about, and then it's, it's, it, then it's easier for you as the parent, as the accused. And you're, you, you have more tools to work with with regard to protecting your kids against the government. So no matter what CPS is trying to do to your kids, if they're trying to force them into some sort of group home, let's just say you have a 12-year-old who's angry, probably because they got thrown into foster care, and now CPS wants to throw them into a group home, you are more likely to find stuff on that in the laws than if you were in family court. Family court is a gigantic blank check. It's a free-for-all. It's all based on best interest of the child. There's no standards. There's zero standards. One judge on a Monday can determine that the kids are better off with mom because mom has a bigger backyard. And a judge on a Tuesday could take kids away from that same parent or, you know, a parent with a big back backyard because the kids could get lost in the woods. And so what, what one judge thinks is whatever their thoughts are, the, another judge could have the exact opposite effect. I'll give you an example. I remember in 2015, I want to say, we had a new judge, and I, I used to get excited every time there was a new judge because I kept getting really bad judges, and every time that bad judge would leave, I would get excited thinking a better judge would come along because I was in that mindset that I just need that good judge to get my son back. Not going to happen, but at the time, that's where I was, and I remember sitting there watching this new judge work, okay? And in my life, in my lifetime with family court, my case has always been called last. The reason for that is because my case is so corrupt that the judge doesn't want an audience. They don't want to abuse me with an audience. I'm a gigantic pain in the ass in the system because I helped reform the laws. I helped pass two different laws in Connecticut. And the last thing these judges want to do is be nice to me. So they tend to wait and, and take my case last. That way there's no audience. Everybody's gone. So like 4.15 p.m., that's when my name is called. So I would sit from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. and just watch case after case after case. And this judge was so nice to everybody. She had these parents like, she was trying to get with my man and she blah, blah, blah. She don't have a bedroom and he don't have a bedroom. And like, like, and then the guy would be like, oh, she, she, you know, living with no electricity. And like these like ghetto ass people were fighting in court. And I'm like, okay. And, and the judge was so nice. She's like, okay, well, why don't you guys try to work something out? Um, why don't you guys, why don't you just let her see the child, you know, three extra days a week or something. And, and she was taking parents off supervised visitation and she was like ordering equal parenting, like left and right, like case after case after case. And I was getting so excited. I was like, I was like, yes, this is amazing. Like, how can I not get my son back? You know, I speak in clear sentences. I'm not chewing gum. You know, I'm not wearing like a muffin top shirt with my tattoos hanging out. You know, I'm, I'm not like acting like that. So of course she's going to give me my son back. And then it was my turn and she was a raging bitch to me. Like, who do you think you are to be here screaming at me? And I was like, whoa, it was like a shock to the conscience. You know, um, I think that's a, le that's a legal term. I don't know if I use that term correctly. But so um, what I'm saying is a judge's freaking temperament means absolutely nothing. Um, it means nothing, nothing. So when you're in family court, you can't, there's no, there's nothing to 
stick with. Like you're, you can't be like, well, that judge did this thing, so I'm gonna use that strategy. You can't build a strategy in family court, period. The only strategy you could build in family court is to use your rights, okay? And if I was smart enough, well, I don't wanna say that, but if, if I was knowledgeable enough from 2010 to 2015, I would have been like, you don't need to know what, what my backyard looks like. You don't need to know how many bedrooms I have in my home. You don't need to know if I had a boyfriend in the past year. You don't need to know if my mom was an alcoholic. I mean, these judges use these invasive means to pretend that they're trying to manufacture uh, an opinion about what's best for your kids. And I would have just said, you don't need to know these things about me because I have an absolute right to be a parent to my child. And until you prove me unfit, you can't take that away. And I never said that. So in family court, there's no standards to adhere to. Nobody knows what the best interest of the standard is. You learn about what the best interest of this of the child's standard is in your case after the fact. You learn that when you get your orders. When you get your 20 page orders, you learn what the judge thinks is best for your child, but it's too late because now the decision's made and you can't go back in time and be like, oh crap, I should have gotten um, a booster seat. You know, and, you know, like these judges will come up with anything. I should have, I should not have taken him out of the booster seat when he was seven. I should have kept him in until he was eight. Or I shouldn't have put him in private school because he got laughed at in geography class. And that was a, that was part of the decision. Like there are so many fe fucking nuances when it comes to these decisions. And you can't possibly know what the best interest of your child is until you get your orders, which is already too late. You can't do anything about it. The time to learn about the best interest of your child, if this is even legitimate, which it's not, but the time to learn that is before, before you enter court. Like, hey, what's the best interest of the child? Okay, let me follow these 25 rules. Let me stick with those rules and then I'll go to court and show that I'm sticking with those rules. But you learn the rules after the fact and that's unconstitutional. There's case law in Connecticut that says you can't do that. <laughs> and I actually used that in my appeal and they shredded my documents and yeah, we won't go there today. So, so, in, in, in family court, it's a free-for-all. You have a blindfold on, you're feeling your way in the dark, you don't know anything, okay? The only thing that you can possibly stick with in, uh, in the family court is your rights. You have to have your constitutional rights and those have to be the guiding force in your case in the family court and in CPS court. So anyway, that was a very long description of the pros and cons. So the pros of CPS court is that you have clear you know, guidelines that you could go with and Family court, I mean, a parent, a parent can be placed on supervised visitation in family court on a best interest of the child standard, whereas with DCF and CPS, it's like a little bit different. Anyway, and also CPS and DCF have to reach a higher standard of evidence to cut you off from your child. They have to reach clear and convincing evidence. And the case that backs that up is Santosky versus Kramer from 1982. The, the judge, you know, the, the family, the, the CPS courts, in order to cut you off from your child permanently, they have to apply a very high standard of evidence. Whereas in family court, you can cut off somebody from their child on a best interest standard. Um, and they won't call it a termination of rights. They'll just not let you ever see your freaking kid again. But they won't call it a termination of rights. They'll just not let you see. I mean, that's, that's a termination of rights, you know? <laughs> and so, and so it's, and it's very hard to appeal a family court order if you're asking the judge to make a best interest opinion. It's very hard to appeal that because that's like asking does this dress make me look fat? And if they say yes, you can't really fight back because you asked for their opinion. It's basically, is this dress making me look fat kind of law, which is not a law, it's an opinion. So I think family court, I, if I were to choose, I would rather work inside a DCF court or a CPS court. And that's where I did most of my ADA advocacy is in that court. Very few cases I've ever done in, inside the family court. So anyway, um, so, my notes are scattered AF. So let me, um, so here's the thing. This is a big thing. When I was taking these notes, these messy notes, they're just, they're, they're so messy. The word leverage kept popping up into my mind every five seconds. I was like, leverage, leverage, leverage. Okay. And that's why the word leverage is in the title of this training. Because one thing that you have, no matter which court you're in, you have a ton of leverage. You have more leverage than you could possibly know. You are the parent of your child. You have a sacred bond with your child. You have a fundamental right that is protected uh, with your child and it's protected by the constitution. So that is a, a gigantic grenade. And, and these little CPS people, they have like water guns or like pellet guns or Nerf guns or whatever. They have nothing. They have so little things to work with. 
compared to what you have. What you have is your fundamental rights and you have the laws on your side and the laws are abundant. You can't possibly um, ever learn your rights in this lifetime because there's so many examples of how your rights apply in this world, you know? And so what CPS depends on is your fear. <laughs> They depend on your belief that you don't have these rights or that if you do use these rights, you're going to get punished or you're not smart enough to use these rights. And it depends on it, it, they they um, they depend on you being as disempowered as possible and not using that leverage. They depend on you not uh, or not even knowing about it. I mean, most parents that I work with haven't had any training on this except for their eighth grade civics class. And even me, like I'm not even, a, I didn't even finish high school. So I missed out on so much like good academic stuff growing up that I knew nothing. <laughs> I had to learn the hard way. I had to get my kid taken away from me for me to start learning this stuff. So the good news is that there is so much information out there. And in 2020, you can get that information. It's available everywhere. I mean, I found a $5 book on the constitution. And when it comes to learning this boring stuff, like the law, so boring, by the way. Gosh, anyone who's been through law school, like you're a saint. Um, I have found that listening to it audio, like aud like through my ears, <laughs> is more effective. And so if I want to read like a fiction novel, I'll read it. But if I want to take in boring information, I will uh, play audiobooks of the Constitution. And I mean, I found a, an amazing uh, $5 Constitution book on, on Audible. And there's also like audio trainings. There's lectures that you could find on YouTube. Every once in a while, you'll get some law school kid who like uploads one of their lectures onto YouTube, which is hilarious because it's probably not allowed. But like Duke University, I found some of their law school lectures on YouTube. Cornell, like you could find so much stuff on the freaking internet. It's crazy. I mean, who's stopping some 20 year old law school kid or whatever, however old they are from taking a chapter of one of their books and just uploading it to the to the web you know like you could find stuff it, this is not 1994 where you are stuck in the law library with an 85 year old law librarian helping you find your books which is really difficult um and even when i had my son taken from me in 2010 there wasn't enough there was we didn't have scribd google drive wasn't around youtube really wasn't a big thing Fa there were there were no facebook groups when my son was taken and now you can get so much information. You could find a law, you could get a law library, you could get access to the law library from the internet and read other cases. Like you can literally find all of this and most parents don't know that. <laughs> and so the information is there, okay? And so you have this, you can do this. <laughs> you could absolutely do this. So. You have leverage and you have the internet you, and you have resources. You're resourceful because you could find what you need to find and implement it and you are smart enough because I'm a high school dropout and I was able to do this so anyone could do this. So, um, but the fear, you know, being afraid and, and, you know, thinking that these people have the upper hand on you, which they do not, that will cloud your judgment. It will cloud your thoughts. It will make you feel bad about yourself. And the worst thing of all is when they actually take your child and throw your child into foster care that will destabilize you and, and affect your functioning. I mean, right? Like, gosh, I, even parents who have their kids four days a month lose some of their functioning because it's so painful. Um, you know, I go 12 days a month at a time without seeing my son. And it's, it's, I have learned to deal with it, but it's very destabilizing. So when that happens, the parent, the last thing the parent wants to do is start learning their rights. They'd rather just work with their court, court appointed attorney and let the attorney do everything. It's so much easier. And it's like the default pattern is like, okay, let the people with the suits deal with it. This person went to law school. This person knows the law. This person knows the judge. This person knows the social workers. I'm going to just outsource my power to the court appointed attorney or the private attorney. And so we lose, we get, we basically lose our, our leverage. Understandably, it's human nature. Um, but you know, there's accounts of people in concentration camps, you know, Victor Frankl, Man's Search for Meaning, that is all about that. You know, you can in, absolutely read that book. That's one of the best books out there. And you can do anything. You can, you have what it takes to do anything 
with regard to this. And if you're, and I hate to say this, this is going to sound horrible, but it, it's not meant to be horrible. If your children are in foster care, you're going to have a lot of free time because you're not cooking for them and cleaning, cleaning with them. You know, you're going to have a lot of free time. You can dive into this and empower the hell out of yourself and fight back because you have the, you have so much leverage, tons of leverage. It's like a gift. It's like this, it's like, it's like Ned Stark's ice. <laughs> you guys watch Game of Thrones? You have Ned Stark's ice and these motherfuckers have nothing. <laughs> they have nothing. They have the hope that you'll like give away your power. Um, and so when your kids are, oh yeah. So when you're stuck in fear, <laughs> I try not to swear. Um, when you're stuck in fear and you're, you know, mourning and grieving. You know, I was just talking to a dad today who said that he's just suffering from grief. You know, he hasn't seen his kids in four months. And that will hold, that will slow you down. That will keep you from being efficient. Um, combat veterans, like it's the same kind of trauma. And so I do recommend getting help. And if you do see a therapist, I would specialize in a therapist that has experience in combat veterans uh ideally like a therapist who has worked with people who've suffered extreme government abuse like the sarin gas in syria or um i mean if you could get a, an american therapist who came from overseas who has lived through hell combat veteran or like some sort of refugee something that has to do with government trauma this is the internet you know, if you live in Maine, you could probably find someone in Oklahoma that will help you. So I would just start asking around for like trauma informed therapists who n understand government abuse, you know, maybe someone who's written a book. I think you can do it and it that will help you get the energy that you need to move forward. So and so when you start using your rights now, when you start researching this, you're not going to know what you're doing. You're going to be like, I have no idea what any of this means. I mean, how many of you have done that? Put it in the comments. Have, have you? open the practice book and you see, and it looks like, uh, it's just, so, it's insane. <laughs> and you don't, you don't even know what you're supposed to be looking at. You could spend two hours reading about subpoenas and then realize that you're not even supposed to be researching that. And so there's going to be a lot of like wasted time, but not really because everything that you learn, it's going to start coming together. It's like a new language. I mean, have you ever picked up a second language? And for the first year that you're in that foreign country, everything just sounds like garble. <laughs> And you're just walking around and all you hear is blah, 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 blah. it doesn't, it doesn't. And then after 12 months or 18 months or something, the sentences just start to form in your head. All right. I have, I speak two languages and I know that feeling. <laughs> I, I, I could distinctly remember what, it, what that was like for me. So you have this, you can do this. How do attorneys do it? How, how do attorneys learn all this stuff? They'd learn it by going to law school, right? You're not going to be in law school, but you could still learn the law. I mean, how is that any different? You're not sitting in a freaking university. Who cares? You could still learn if you're not sitting in a university. If you're not taking the LSATs and the passing the bar exam, you could still learn stuff. Okay. And, and you have, you have, you love your children. So that's going to, that's going to move you forward. You're going to have way more leverage <laughs> than anyone else. I'm telling you, you could do, you could absolutely do this. So, um, so why am I telling you, like, learn your rights, learn the laws? I'm telling you this because if you do get a court-appointed attorney or any attorney, that can work <laughs> if you are the person controlling that relationship. You have to, it's like if you're building a house and you want a contractor to come and, like, frame your house and decide where the bathroom's going to go, where, you know, what kind of siding are you going to put up? Are you going to have a gravel walkway or a brick, you know? You're going to be the one saying, you, you know, you don't know how to do this stuff, but you're going to know, oh, I want this here. I want that there. I, you're going to have it in your mind how you want things to go. And all your attorney has to do is do what you say because that's their job. So, I mean, you can just say, I don't want to take a psyche valve because the state hasn't had, doesn't have any probable cause. And so I want you to write up a whatever objection or uh cross response or whatever it's called cross what's that called uh response cross cross complaint i don't know it's something like that and you could tell your attorney to do that and your attorney will format the thing and you know and you can say i'd like to look this over before you send it i mean you're gonna look like a gigantic pain in the ass but who cares 
<laughs> it's not, you're, you'll, you'll get over that. It's, it's hard to be that person and be extra and all that, but it's, but you can do it. And, and if you do it very compassionately and, you know, like you, you can do it without being mean and, and, and rude to the, to the attorney. You can be very, very nice to your attorney, be very appreciative. I, I mean, I found that if I just treat these people like people, then they, they tend to, you know, but they're going to try to control you. They're going to say, no, the judge won't like that. That's going to look bad. They're going to draw, you know, negative opinions about you. They're going to think that you're, you have something to hide. They're going to try to talk you out of it. And so that's where you, if you're learning your rights, you'll know that even if you are using your rights and even if it does look suspicious, suspicious is not a legal term. It's not a, there's no standard in the law on what suspicious means. And in fact, the Supreme Court has said that people can't act just based on gut instinct. A police officer can't pull you over just because they have an instinct. Just because they think you might be committing a crime, they can't pull you over, they can't search your car, they can't arrest you. And so these CPS people have the same standards. They have to follow the same laws that police officers do. And if a CPS person is pounding on your door and wants to investigate, then you have the absolute right to say no. You can ask them to produce a warrant. And fine, let them go get their warrant. You know, parents are always like, oh my God, but if, you, but if I say that, they're just going to go get their warrant. I'm like, great, let them go get their freaking warrant. You know, let them spend half a day in court waiting around for the judge. And they're not going to have anything because these CPS people, they typically build their case after you've already consented to letting them in your life. So it's kind of ironic. 90, I mean, again, not this is not factual information. This is just based on all the, the knowledge that I've had sitting through these CPS cases for five years. They build their case after you consent to having them in your life. So if you say, yes, sure, I'll do the case plan. I'll do the drug testing. I'll do the, the therapy. I'll, I'll put my kid in therapy. I'll, I'll do the parenting classes. I'll do the home visits. When you agree to that, then they start to build their case. So it's like they, uh, what's that word called? <laughs> what a horrible comparison, but it's kind of like, if you build it, they will come. <laughs> that's like the dumbest, like that's not the right thing, but I hope you get what I'm saying. It's like they, they throw it out there, they cast their net. And then once the parent says, yes, I'll do the case plan. I'll do this. I'll do that. Then they could come in and build their case. Now, how do they do that? Well, they, you know, they'll, They'll tell you to go to therapy and then they'll get, they'll try to get records to your therapist and parents will sign away. You know, they'll say, yes, sure. Go ahead and take a look at my records. And, and then they'll find notes like, oh, the therapist noted that this parent was tired on that day. Oh, oh why was the parent tired? And then they kind of like put that little, you know, marble in the jar. And then, and then they'll see that the child had a tantrum during a visit. <laughs> I mean, seriously, guys, my four-year-old daughter throws a fit every time I leave the house. I can't even check the freaking mail without my kid throwing a fit because she has this insane, like, need to never let me leave her sight. It's just a phase. That's just what kids do, right? Like, some kids do that. So if you are if you have a two-hour visit with your child and it's supervised because you agreed to it and your kid has tantrums because they don't want the visit to end, <laughs> why wouldn't they have a tantrum? What are they going to do? Be like, bye, mom. Mwah. Bye. Thank you for the present. No, they're not going to do that. They're going to throw an absolute fit. And so the, 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 your social worker will document that, like, oh, the child's throwing fits. And, I mean, if you, if, you, if you have trouble sleeping and you need to get on a medication to sleep better because your kids got taken and you can't sleep at night, they're going to note that. So, like, they build the case after you agree to the case plan, which is sad. What if, and this is not legal advice, if you want to get into a case plan, some parents will do this if, I mean, personally me, I would do a case plan if it meant keeping my children in my home. If my kids were already taken from my home and thrown into foster care, I'm not doing no motherfucking case plan. I'm going to ask for a trial. I'm going to say, I want a trial like yesterday. And I'm going to push and push and push and push for that trial because I want the state to prove me unfit. That's their job. They, they bear the burden of proof to prove that, the, that I'm unfit. And so if I don't agree to a case plan, then they have no material. They have nothing. They have the call, the initial call from the anonymous person who made the complaint, which could have been your neighbor. It could have been your ex-mother-in-law. It could have been your ex. It could have been a teacher. It could have been a number of people. And so they're going to have that call, that referral. And, you know, maybe your trash wasn't taken out the night before. And I don't know, like they're going to have nothing. Because all they're going to have is like their experience going to your front door 
and the call and then how you responded when they tried to get into your house and how you're responding how you're responding to their phone calls and their mail and hey we don't even answer the phone my husband and i don't even answer the phone when they call we let that go right to voicemail and so <laughs> because I, i'm not under any obligation to talk to you i have better things to do seriously like that's the kind of arrogance my husband and i have now about cps like we are just great we are just so arrogant with them because we know that we have leverage we have we hold all the cards we hold all the power and i know that sounds arrogant and cocky but it's true They're, you know these are our children these are your children and so we, we we don't answer the phone when they call if they write letters we'll read them but we're not going to respond we don't do anything if they want if they're that concerned they'll get a warrant and they'll do everything the, the proper way if they have a warrant then they do have to get into your home but it's really hard to get a warrant when you have nothing when they have nothing um I mean, it's just really, really hard. <laughs> and sometimes they'll get a warrant because the judge sometimes will issue them like candy. And um, if they get their warrant, you know, that's fine, but you could still maintain your rights. Like you could, you know, you could, I don't know if you could challenge a warrant, but I'm sure that there's something you could do. So, um, but you don't have to, but even if they get a warrant and they search your home, you still don't have to agree to a case plan. So, but again, me being where I'm at right now in my life, I would agree to a case plan if it meant keeping my kids in my house because I would rather I would rather do dumb things like take drug tests and stuff if it meant parenting my kids every day um, than, than uh, having my kids put into foster care. How do I how do I say that? If it meant keeping if it meant keeping if, I, if my kids were going to be taken out of my home, if I don't do the case plan, I will take the case plan because I'd rather parent my kids, even if it meant being, you know, screwed over by the government at the same time. But I would still maintain my rights. I would still ask for a trial. I would still like I would still be very arrogant in that process. And if I was forced into therapy or forced into drug tests or something, I would tell the, the person you know, I'm here under duress because they threatened to throw my kids in foster care. Like I would just make sure that the whole freaking planet knew about it <laughs> because I want these workers, all these vendors, you know, the, the drug people, the, for the therapy people, like all these external, um, contractors, I want them to know what they're, what they're dealing with. You know, a lot of times they're, they're they don't understand. A lot of times these contractors are oblivious to what's really happening in the system. So I would use that as my mouthpiece to express how corrupt the system is. So anyway, um, let's see here. Yeah, we covered all that. So yeah, I mean, leverage is the word on the street. You have lots and lots and lots of leverage. Understand that and believe it, okay? I mean, I just can't stress that enough. And so let's see, I wanna make sure I covered, that I'm covering everything that I said I was gonna do. We're gonna talk about case plan versus a trial. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that. So one of the things I said we would cover is, do you open the door to CPS, yes or no? Um, not legal advice. You can if you want to, it's your house. You know, if you wanna have them over, fine. But um, I would not. <laughs> I would absolutely positively not open the door for CPS without a warrant. I do not answer phone calls. I would not respond to letters. I don't do anything. Cause I'm not gonna help my um, um, opponent build their case. I'm not going to, I'm not going to give them tools to build a case against me. If they want to build a case against me, they could do that. You, you don't need my cooperation. This, and I've said this, I'm like, you don't need us to cooperate with you to build a case on us. You could just build a case on your own. If we're abusing our kids, then surely you, you, you have a, you, you could do that without us cooperating with you. They want your cooperation because they want to build their case. They, ha they don't have their case yet. They're like, shit, we don't have a case. We need you to help us build the case. <laughs> That's what they're doing. They're asking for help. And so if they legitimately, if your kids are legitimately being abused, they're not gonna need your cooperation to find out if your kids are being abused. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, just think about this. It's, it's so funny. So the other thing is, if you're not facing criminal charges, then, I mean, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But no, I personally don't answer the door. A lot of parents will say, you need to open the door. You need to open the door. They're not attorneys. I'm not an attorney either. So, I mean, don't take my word for it, but understand that you have the absolute right to not open the door without a warrant. You can look difficult. You can look like you have something to hide. Great. You're like, I've said this to them, like, and I'm very nice about it. I've, I have said your personal opinions about my choice to use my constitutional rights is not my problem. And so they, they've also said stuff like, you know, you, you're, you're interfering with our ability to conduct an investigation. 
you are blocking an investigation, you are preventing us from doing our jobs. And I've always said very nicely, I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm very sorry you feel that way, but your paperwork problem is not my problem. And, and my constitutional rights are not um, subordinate to your paperwork problem. If you have a paperwork problem, I'm, you know, you're gonna have to just figure that out. <laughs> That's your problem. I have paperwork issues too with my business, you know? I know I'm not gonna violate somebody else's rights to help me with my paperwork problem. So they'll say all a bunch of things and they'll try to manipulate you and make you feel like, oh shit, I better cooperate. You know, they're, they could really come after me, blah, blah, blah. But uh, I'm just telling you, this is just what has happened in my case. This is what has happened with other parents I've worked with. I have never seen a parent use their rights with CPS and regret it, okay? I have not. Family court, it's a little bit more difficult because, you know, it's just, it's not the same thing. But I have not yet seen a parent use their rights and say, man, I really wish I didn't use my rights in CPS. I, I have not yet seen that. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. I just personally haven't seen it. And, I, and again, I have clients that have got, had tremendous success using their rights in CPS court. So, um, so yeah, no. So the answer is I would not open the door to CPS. And um, let's get back a little bit to this court-appointed attorney thing. If you're going to have a court-appointed attorney and they're not going to work for you, um, gosh, I had a client with a four month old daughter who she was breastfeeding, who this little baby was, uh, about to be shipped off to foster care. And it was absolutely freaking, I don't know how this mom survived that. Cause personally, like I have not dealt with that. I mean, my son was, uh, three when he was taken from me, that's a lot different than four months. I mean, he wasn't breastfeeding anymore at that time. And so she had, I think she went to, she went through two attorneys and I think she was on her way to getting a third attorney and um all her attorneys were like I'm not doing that for you I'm not going to tell the judge that you have fourth amendment rights I'm not doing that and and the reason they won't do that is because that's that that's their referral person like the, these judges are giving them their business so why would why would these attorneys bite the hand that's feeding them they're getting paid 20 percent of what their peers are being paid and so put yourself in their situation. They have families to feed. They have food to put on the table. Why would they alienate themselves from a judge who gives them referrals? It's a, it's a horrible, horrible system. It's a, there's a conflict of interest. These attorneys can't defend their, their clients. They can't defend their clients effectively. They're going to ask their clients to agree to like a no contest plea where you might not agree that you abused your kids, but you're gonna agree that your kids were harmed. And that's considered uh, a nolo contendere plea, I believe. Do check the laws, but I'm pretty sure that that's what it means. It might be different in every state, but typically nolo to contendere is when you're saying, look, I'm not admitting guilt, but I'm going to admit that my kids need care by the state. My kids were neglected. I'm not saying who, who it was, or, you know, I'm not saying it was me. I'm not saying it was my ex. I'm not saying it was the uncle across the street or the neighbor, but my child was, was neglected and my child was abused. And what that does is, is it still gets the kid into state care. It doesn't, it, but the parent won't be prosecuted. Well, who freaking cares? You are being prosecuted if your kids are being taken from you. I mean, that's, that's your pun. That's still punishment. So just because they're not, you know, giving you a little spanking doesn't mean anything. That's not, that's not a good deal. And so, um, and oftentimes the parents will plea this, they'll do this because they don't want to go to trial. They're scared to death of trial. They don't know how to cross-examine people. They don't know how to present evidence. They don't know how to mark evidence. They don't know how to mark exhibits. They don't know the difference between uh, an exhibit for identifications and a full exhibit. I mean, all this crap is so overwhelming for the layperson. And But this information is available. On the internet <laughs> you know you can learn this and it's gonna suck for a while but if your kids aren't with you um, then you can you can you can take that time and learn you know that's parenting if you can't parent your children in real time hands-on then parent your children by learning the laws so that you could get your children back and I have I, I don't know of any I mean maybe you guys know I don't know of any cases where a parent used their rights and the state retaliated by adopting the kids out. I'm sure it's happened. I haven't, but I haven't seen it happen. I've seen DCF just back off like, whoops, sorry. We'll go harass another family. They tend to back off. They withdraw 
or a judge will, I don't, I mean, a judge will see that the parent knows what they're talking about and the judge will say, you don't have a case and dismiss the case before it even goes to trial, which is incredible. We've had that happen in, in our, in our situation. We demanded a trial. We said, we want a trial. We want a trial right now. We are not agreeing to anything. If they say, how was your day today? I wouldn't even answer. If you say I'm having a good day, they could say, well, you're doing great without your kids. If you say I'm having a crappy day, they're going to say you're too sick to get your kids back. You're not mentally healthy to get your kids back. So I wouldn't even answer that. If, you, if the social worker or anybody says, how was your day? I would say, you know, I appreciate you asking. I know you're just trying to make conversation, but by me answering that question, it could potentially be used against me. So I'd rather withhold the answer. I'm like, they, they'll, they'll leave you alone. I promise you, like they leave you alone. They're like, oops. And they sit on the other side of the courthouse like the whole time, which is so funny. But we have, we have said no, no, and no to everything. And, um, and we've had, we, I think we've had five open CPS cases against me and my husband. My husband, it was my husband's ex-wife that was doing the majority of the, the, um, instigate, the, initiation. Um, my husband's ex-wife was willing to have the state involved in her life forever as long as it's hurting me and my husband because we had two little babies and, and she didn't. She had teenagers so she was trying to get us, she was trying to get our babies taken away from us. We have a two-year-old and a four-year-old right now um, and so you know and I had my babies at home and I'm like the perfect parent for CPS to go after because I'm natural and all that stuff or whatever like not doing hospital births. So um, so anyway um, so what parents will do often is they will uh, avoid a trial because it's way too intimidating. I mean, I, I'll be honest, trial litigation is weird to me. It's, it's, it's confusing. I still don't get it, you know, when to object, how to object, on what grounds. But you can learn. You can learn this. You can sit through other people's hearings and watch how it works. Not in CPS, but watch it in family court. Watch it in criminal court. Like, watch other hearings and watch what litigation looks like, you know? And the other beautiful thing is, um, and I, this is not legal advice, don't take my word for it. If you're the one being accused of anything, the state has to prove its case. You don't have to prove anything. Parents, oh my gosh, you guys think that you have to prove that you're fit. I have a, I have a mom that reached out to me a week ago and she said, uh, they unsubstan you know, they, ne they never substantiated me for abuse or neglect. They said I'm a good parent but they want to make absolute sure I'm a good parent. So I'm doing a case plan and her baby's not with her. And so um, it's not the state's job to make sure that you're a good parent. It's not the state's job to check up on you to make sure you're a good parent. The state can only act if you're not a good parent, if you're, if you're hurting your kids. You could be an average parent. You could be like a C minus D plus parent and the state still can't get involved. You have to be like in the D minus F range for the state to get involved. There's a trigger. There's like a specific threshold in which the state can get involved. Um, the state can't get involved simply because they have a gut feeling or they want to make sure, like, we're going to put your kid in foster care just to make sure you're a good mom. Uh, that is 1000% unconstitutional. And um, unfortunately, this parent is in a case plan. This parent pleaded uh, no contest, you know, and it was because um, she was too traumatized to go forward with a trial because it, it is overwhelming. You have your baby ripped from you and the last thing you want to do is figure out how to do a trial against people who are hiring the attorney general to, to work with them. But if you're not doing the case plan, then they don't have anything to work with. They don't have any raw materials. It's like they, they're building a house with like three bricks and a bucket, you know, whereas if you do a case plan, there's just more and more material that they can digest and, and look through. They can get access to medical records and they can just, I mean, in my case, my, uh, our worker was trying to go back to when I was in high school, you know, I'm 41. And so they will, their, their reach is so broad and unbridled it, and they'll just go everywhere. They were trying to investigate my brother. My brother doesn't even have kids, but they were trying to like figure out his life. And I'm like, why do you give a crap at what my brother does? My brother doesn't have kids. And so they'll do that. They'll say, well, your sister has this and your mom has this and that's bad. <laughs> and, and so why not just not give them any information? Um, they, they ask moms, how many abortions have you had? How many par uh, sexual partners have you had? Have you ever had STDs? And, and so in these parents, they feel like they have to answer and God forbid they lie. And it's, it's a mess. 
it's such a mess. Um, in my family court case, we, I had a, a, a caseworker or custody evaluator, which is, these are all these people do the same things. They check your medical, your this and that. She was calling up UConn to get my grade point average to find out if I have career prospects. And she concluded that I didn't. She said, she, Monica has no career prospects. And, um, and she recommended that I lose custody of my son. And, and it worked. I lost freaking custody of my son because I let this caseworker, um, you know, interview ex-boyfriends, interview former roommates, interview my, like all these people and um, check up on my grade point average. So their, their reach is so broad that it's dangerous for you. And then when you finally do go to trial, because that's what's going to happen is you, you plead no contest. And um, after a while, 12 to 18 months in, in Connecticut, it's 22 months. Um, maybe that's maybe that's everywhere. I don't know. But, you know, it's a while. Your child's going to be in foster care for a period of time. And at some point, they have to shit or get off the pot. They have to either return your child or they have to move for a termination of your parental rights. And if there is a termination hearing, then you're going to have your child that you said no to years years before. And so once that trial happens, that's really scary because now they have two years of medical history. They have two, they have, well, not two years of medical history. They have all your medical history, but they have all the therapy appointments. They have all the drug screenings. They have this and that. And so now they have a lot of materials and they can doctor stuff. They could alter stuff. They can throw stuff out. They can take other people's um, opinions and twist them. You know, they'll be like, I talked to her therapist. The therapist said she's a complete mess. Um, I talked to his, uh, you know, domestic violence worker. And they, this domestic violence worker said that he was throwing things during the session. And, you know, and I've had this happen. I, when I was early on in my case, when I was giving up my rights to everybody, um, my custody evaluator, the lady who checked up on my GPA, um, said I talked to all of Monica's therapists going back to when she was born. And they all said that she was crazy, you know, and none of them said that, but they weren't there to speak. And I didn't know how to cross examine her at the time. I didn't have a lawyer. I didn't know anything. And I had my son taken away and that was in family court. So I don't want to confuse you. So if you get that trial early, you know, if you demand the trial early, they won't have anything to present because you didn't let them in. And it's going to be really hard to do that. And I have not seen that yet work. I have never seen a parent have their child taken him to foster care, demand the trial, screw the case plan, and then have the ch children completely adopted out. I have not yet seen that happen. I'm sure it's happened. Um, it happened, um, maybe it's happened before, but very few parents will ever ask for a trial early on. Like they'll, they'll take the case plan. They'll plead no contest or whatever. They'll, they'll, they'll agree to the case plan. And oftentimes what's being held as the carrot is visits with their kids. You know, you're not going to get visits if you don't take the case plan. And these parents who are suffering so badly are like, oh my God, I will do anything to have visits with my kids. I will do, like, I will do anything. And that's so hard to say no to because you want those two hour visits, you know, in the little, you know, chlamydia supervised visitation room. You, but that's, that's all you have with your children. You're going to take that time. You're going to like relish in it, you know, but the problem with that is that you're going to be on that loop for two years. And, and I mean, so I get it. I understand why parents do these, these case plans. They want to see their kids and, or they're afraid of the trial process. I mean, there's so many reasons. There's so many like logical reasons to take the, or there's so many emotional reason, reasons to agree to the case plan. If, and so sometimes CPS will say like, well, you're not going to get visits with your kids. If you're going to go to trial, you're not getting visits. And what parent wants to go six months without seeing their kids? So it's a personal decision. It's a gamble. I mean, I'm not telling you what to do. This isn't legal advice. I'm just telling you, I have observed repeatedly the parents who use their rights from the beginning don't regret it. The parents who own the fact that they have the leverage, they do fine. I mean, I mean, it's scary. It's really hard to tell these people to pound sand. It's, I'm not good at stuff like that. I'm not good at telling caseworkers leave me alone. You know, I like to, I'm a people pleaser. So, um, so yeah, let me see if I covered everything. Um, yeah. So anyway, the court appointed attorney, um, if you do have one, I keep going back to this, I would make sure that you are the one directing that relationship. You might get fired by 
a bunch of them. And that's really unfortunate. Um, and you might have to go without a lawyer. Um, I've had, I had clients have to deal with CPS without a lawyer because they can't get a lawyer that will represent them the way they want to be represented. And that's really scary. But we've also gone without a lawyer too. And we did just fine. Um, so, um, let's see. Yeah, I covered everything I want to cover. Now, I would go on YouTube and watch attorneys. So what's interesting about, there are a bunch of really amazing attorneys out there, but they're not all super great at creating really good content that is digestible for people like us. But there are a few attorneys who have created like really good YouTube channels and really good podcasts. They're not a lot. Attorneys typically aren't like artsy and, you know, into like uh, media and, you know, that's kind of more of a younger generation, like, but occasionally you can find a really good YouTube channel like Sean McMillan. Um, there's a guy named um, Vince, Davi Vince Davis. He's got a really good channel and he gets it. Get, find somebody who understands that the system is corrupt. There's a, an attorney, Wendy something, and she does command in the courtroom. She doesn't acknowledge the corruption. And, and that's fine. Most of them won't because they don't want to be... Uh, beaten down by the bar industry for outing, you know, throwing these judges under the bus and stuff. So, but Wendy doesn't, doesn't hit the, she doesn't hit the spot. Um, so, but you could still follow her. Just understand if they're not addressing the corruption, it's, there's only so much they could help. But there are really good people out there that will address the corruption. So blogs, um, you know, any, I wouldn't pay attention to anybody who says, don't use the constitution. It's going to piss off the judge. <laughs> I mean, I just, I would just move on. This is just my personal opinion. It's not legal advice and you are powerful enough to do this. Honest to God, you are absolutely able to do this. Let me see how much time we have. I wanted to keep this under an hour. Let's just see how successful I've been because I don't know what time it is and I'll probably hang up on you guys if I reset my phone. All right. Now my computer is not working. Oh, well. So the, the battery died. So let me see if I could get to some of these questions. Oh, it's 930. That's freaking perfect. Oh my God. Amazing. So, um, Christina, if you're still with us, I don't know what TIC training is. If you want to fill me in, that would be awesome. I have TIC training from my previous job and I think it's a training even teachers should take. Cool. Let's see. We have a lot of new people coming into the group. That's awesome. Um, let's see if we have any other questions. I remember I ended up thinking that the less evidence I present, the less the judge can twist. I love that. That's brilliant because do you really, I mean, not a, this is not legal strategy. Don't take my word for it, but really, do you really need evidence? The burden of proof is on the other side. They're the ones trying to take something from you. You're not trying to take anything from anybody. You're, you're not the one that is creating the cause of action. It's them. So why, why do you have to bring in evidence? I mean, I've always joked around saying, you know what I'm bringing to court? I'm bringing one of these and that's it. <laughs> I'm not even bringing a piece of paper to write on. I'm going to show up in court with a pencil, maybe click my pen or, you know, just to be annoying. No, I'm kidding. I've never, I've, I, that's one thing I don't do. I do not bring in expert witnesses, my therapist to talk about how great I am. I'm not going to bring in my neighbor to say what a great neighbor I am. I mean, I have people bringing in like the Jeffersons to trial. It's like crazy. It's like, why are you bringing all these people? I had a client, my very last ADA client, this was actually a family court case. He brought in like five witnesses. I'm like, who are all these people? You, all these people took the day off to say that you're a good father. Really? It's the other side's job to say that you're not a good father. Anyway, that's just some little rant. So we have, um, how do I get out of my head? My ex's attitude that I'm no longer my daughter's mother. When I reminded him, you know I'm their mother, he said, uh, I guess. And then he and then said biological, he threatened to get rid of me. So I'm guessing that you are the biological mom. Um, and if your ex doesn't think you are, then he's wrong. <laughs> um, how do I get out of my head my ex's attitude that I'm no longer my daughter's mother? When I reminded him, you know I'm their mother, he said, I guess. So what, what, what has to happen in that case is that you have to set boundaries with you and your former partner. And boundaries are internal. It has nothing to do with how you act or how you behave or what you think. 
it's internal. You can set an internal boundary. Like my son's father thinks I'm a crack hoe. I mean, he's probably, he probably tells everybody I'm a crack hoe. He probably tells everybody I'm a bad mom and it's totally fine. Like, I don't care what he thinks. He has the right to think whatever he wants. We all have the absolute right to freedom of conscience. And I can't control what my ex thinks, what my ex says to other people. I have no control. So I just allow, I would just allow your ex to have his opinions and wish him well and be done with it. Your ex is the least important person in your case. I, I say this in my course, The Best Interest of the Parent. Um, in fact, I have an entire module just to help parents understand that your ex has no significance. The only time your ex kind of has significance is if your child's being abused by your ex. That's a different story, you know, because you and you want to prosecute. You want to like somehow um, get the authorities involved. And so I, I also talk about that in my course. So I would just set an internal boundary and just, uh, um, you know, allow that. So I do a lot of meditation. You can do a cord cutting uh, meditation, C-O-R-D or C-H-O-R-D. You can do a cord cutting meditation where you're literally cutting a cord of the hold that your ex has on you. It's really powerful. There, you know, literally like just type in like cord cutting meditations. It sounds like an umbilical cord cutting, but it's not. And it's really, really powerful. And I would do cord cutting meditations like every day. And eventually you're, you're, you're going to stop caring. So um, let's see who else has a question. I refuse to sign, but my ex took services. Okay, yeah, I get that all the time. What happens when the other parent agrees to services? I just spoke to a dad today about this. Um, he says, you know, you know the, his kids were involved in, with state services um, and basically under CPS surveillance because the ex allowed it. So unfortunately, your your other parent has the right to uh, involved this involve the state in their parenting if they want to. Um, the premise of CPS is that they give a crap about kids. They want to protect kids' welfare, and if a if your ex wants to engage the state to help them parent, you know, same thing with getting a guardian ad litem. If your ex wants to get a GAL, fine. Let them let them get government involved in their parenting. If you think you need help with with raising your kids, our kids, and you need the government's help, go for it that's their relationship and if the if your ex wants to bring in state services to help them figure out their parenting because obviously your ex is probably a pretty crappy parent if they're accepting services um obviously they think they need the services that's that's my philosophy my husband's ex-wife took tons of services and our our poor boys um my stepson's have been through so many state services it's just so sad but like we really can't control that because they are the parent if they have legal decision making over your kids then there's nothing we could do but you can certainly decline services in your home your side of the street <laughs> and um yeah there's nothing we could do so i just let that go but you do have the right to access the records because you are the parent your ex is also the parent but you're still the parent and so you can get records so the state might try to d deny you records but you have the right to those records um yeah, so we have great, um, so um, you can go to Insight, Time, Insight Timer and, uh, and look for cord cutting meditations there. I would definitely look into that. Um, I think we covered everything. I didn't, yeah, I wanted to keep it an hour so it looks like we're done. But I appreciate you all coming on and um, we will meet up next Monday. I think I might be running a training next Monday on... Uh, what to do if you want to sue uh, somebody in your case. I get that all the time. How do I sue my ex's attorney? How do I sue the GAL? How do I sue the judge? Parents are always asking that question. So I, I will be doing a training on that. And you might be surprised on how that goes because it might not be the kind of training you're expecting. But, <laughs> but yeah, so I appreciate you all coming on and we will meet up next week. All right, take care. Bye-bye.